This is episode 34 of the 99 Forever podcast. I'm Eric Friesen, and here to help me recap game one and two of the North Division semifinal between the Edmonton Oilers and the Winnipeg Jets is Zane Banji. Zane, welcome back to the show. Hey, Eric. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, man. It's always good to talk hockey with you. I, I wish we had a couple playoff wins to break down tonight, though. Yeah, I, I really wish we did, too. I really wish the Edmonton Oilers were able to kind of pull out a uh, a series-tying win last night. However, um, it was a bit more of a frustrating kind of game. It's been a bit more of a frustrating series to watch, but I guess we're going to get to that within this uh, in this pod, obviously. So I guess, you know, yeah. Eric, how, how have you been? We haven't really connected in the long past, past, couple, past couple weeks. How, how are yeah. things with you? Not too bad, man. I always, uh, you know, ch- I seem this season we checked up on Twitter a couple times with each other just on our pulley RV goal count that we were started back in uh, uh, January, and I want to get to that later in the podcast too. But no, it's it's been good. I mean, the Edmonton Oilers had a a real strong finish to the year, and um, you know, it just uh, even even before we break down these games, I think that's a good place to start is just talking about the the season that they had and. Um, it, it was a fun season to watch. I think this is going to be a season that fans will remember for a lot of reasons. Um, obviously, the pandemic shortened season makes it something to remember. Uh, the all-Canadian division is something we're going to remember 20, 30 years from now. McDavid's historic year. But just the way that the team continued to play, and I think that's one of the things that makes these couple losses so disappointing is that we've seen them bounce back from wins multiple times this year. So I, I fully expected that they would last night as well. Um, but just going back to when you last were on the podcast in January, the Oilers had dropped three of four games on home ice to start the season. And following that disappointing start, the Oilers went 34-16-2 and the rest of the way. Um I think most Oilers fans expected that the team would make the playoffs this year, but could you have ever predicted they would have this great of a season? You know, in all honesty, Eric, I think at the end of this, at the beginning of the season, rather, I I, I was kind of glad that the Oilers kind of got off on the, on on the wrong start, because I think it's always great for a team to kind of start with a little bit of adversity and really kind of pull together their growing pains. And, and I think that showed growth. You know, we in oil country, we've gone through this decade of dark darkness. We, we've gone through a lot of growing pains here. And I think it was good to kind of ha- face a little bit of adversity at the beginning of the season. Because I think that is what is going to ultimately help. And what it's obviously what has helped the Oilers kind of develop uh, into a successful kind of, uh, you know, franchise season and into a historic um, you know, season so far. And I'm kind of hoping that, you know, that that adversity that they had at the beginning of the season will kind of help them and, and, and kind of provide them with those tools and that experience to kind of, you know, kind of push back when their backs are against the wall today or, you know, the, currently as we speak down to nothing. But to answer your question, honestly, I, I did not see this this historic season coming. I did not see Connor McDavid, you know, reaching 100 points in 53 games. Uh, I did not see Leon Drysaddle developing into this, you know, strong two-way centerman that he's become, and to be like this, this, you know, utility guy who's, you know, racking up, you know, almost 25 minutes a night. I didn't see Tyson Berry leading the league and, and le- leading defenseman in, the, in scoring this year either. At first, I was kind of a little bit more skeptical about this signing, especially at the beginning of the season when there was some, some growing pains when he was trying to, uh, you know, adjust to the Oilers' power play. But you know, over the season, his right shot has felt has has fit in really well. Um, he's racked up a lot of assists thanks to kind of just dishing off to McDavid and Drysaddle throughout the power play uh, opportunities that they get. But no, I didn't. To answer your question fully, I did not expect this. Um, I'll kind of throw it right back at you, though, Eric. You know, what what did you kind of expect from this season? And, and yeah. are you kind of what do you did they kind of meet your expectations this year? I thought that they could be either the number one or two team in the North Division, and really, they they were a good team the rest of the season. As we said, after that kind of rough three and six start, um, there was that. Also, that that really tough stretch they had against the Leafs in early February, where they lost three straight games on home ice and only scored one goal. And I'm hoping that a mini series like that is something that they can look back on and try and remember that following that tough stretch of games, they rebounded and had a long month and a half, basically, of success after that, where they were winning night after night. And if they can sort of 
use that mentality coming into their own playoff series right now. Hopefully that they can just use that experience as something to build off of. And But no, I, I just, I don't think Oilers fans could have asked for much more from this team this year. Like I, I like I said, I expected them to make the playoffs. I didn't expect them to be, you know, this dominant of a team though. I mean, they had the second most regulation wins in the entire league. They also tied the Toronto Maple Leafs for the most wins in the North Division and had, I believe, the seventh highest points percentage in franchise history. And it would have been on pace for over 50 wins in a a normal 82-game season. So, um, yeah, despite how things have have gone for the Oilers through the first uh, uh, two games of this playoff series, I'm I'm hoping they can turn it around with another big win uh, in Game 3 and sort of... um, build off this this really good regular season that they had because it, it would it would be unfortunate for them to go out in the first round after the type of uh, of season they put forth in in 2021. Yeah, of course, it, it'd be really disappointing to see all of the, the the regular season success kind of all go to waste in the playoffs. It were mm-hmm. if it were to be a first round exit. Um, but you know what? I, I understand oil country is, is is quite frustrated at the moment and is, you know, you know, every time McDavid gets a shot off, it's blocked. It kind of goes up and out of play. Or you know, Hellebuck's trying to find finds a way to kind of see it. I, I think to myself, you know what? Like, I, this is this is okay. I I think that being down two games to nothing is not being is not okay. However, I think a little bit of adversity is is good for a team, and I think it's healthy. If anything, that it should kind of bring a team together. And you know what we're seeing kind of in in many other series is is nothing like what we're seeing in this specific series in the Edmonton and Winnipeg series. I, you know, to me, I think this is, I think everyone can agree on this. This is a very low event series where teams, where both teams are not really giving up a lot of space. And, and, and this is, this is such a stark contrast to what we've seen throughout the season between these two teams, because every time these teams have faced off, it's been a run and gun kind of showdown. It's been, you know, um, the Jets trying to keep up with the, the high powered offense that the Oilers have. And it's been kind of uh, Mike Smith that has kind of gotten the edge over Connor Hellebuck throughout the regular season. But now we've kind of see a bit of like a, a bit of a, a role reversal or a bit, a bit more of a, a paradigm shift, so to say, where we've kind of entered a whole new paradigm in which the Jets and the Oilers have kind of turned on this playoff mentality and they seem to be able to flick this switch and turn into more very tight checking teams who are able to get six and, and bodies in front of all pucks headed towards the goaltenders and goaltenders are, 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 are having a bit more of an easier time. I find to track pucks down because there's a bit more of a lack of, of uh, I would say maybe bodies in front as opposed to what we were seeing in the regular season. Would you, would you agree with that Eric? Yeah, it's, it's so hard to get space in the middle of the ice right now that both teams are, are taking away time and space. All the shots are basically coming from the perimeter and obviously the, the goal that sealed the the game for the Jets last night was another one of those perimeter shots that just found the way into the back of the net. But um, yeah, the, the Oilers have to find a way to penetrate the middle of the ice and try and drive hard to the net because we know that that's the kind of goals that we're going to see in this series. And that's what it's going to take to get back into it is those greasy, dirty goals. They're not going to be the pretty end-to-end passing two-way uh, or two-on-one rushes up the ice. It's just there's... The, the games are just way too tight for that right now. Um, so let's just go back to game one at, at Rogers place on Wednesday night. And both teams failed to score in the first period. Jesse Pugliarvi opened the scoring for the Oilers in the second period with his first career playoff goal in his first career playoff game. However, the Jets responded with four unanswered goals, including two empty netters to secure a 4-1 win and a one nothing series lead. Zane, it's like we said, this wasn't the result that Oilers fans were hoping for, but let's start with a positive. I think Pugliarvi was arguably the Oilers' best player in Game 1, and I was so happy to see him get his first playoff goal out of the way early. What were your thoughts on his performance in Game 1? Well, I was, first of all, really impressed uh, with how how much kind of zing he kind of brought to the lineup especially in his first career playoff game he seemed ready to go he was raring to go i think over the past week um it was nice to see him kind of get off or kind of get off to a great start in this playoffs and kind of take a bit more um uh, weight kind of off of you know connor's or leon's kind of shoulders and kind of and kind of put down the and put to rest you know the secondary scoring debate with in edmonton which is kind of been you know is edmonton getting enough secondary scoring well 
Yes, Ipoli are we getting on the board first for Edmonton kind of was a was a was a was a positive sign for us in Edmonton. And and it was really nice to see him get rewarded for all of his 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 hard work kind of going to the nets, freeing up space, freeing up pucks for Connor and and Cahoon or Dry Settle sometimes if they were kind of if they were loading up uh, line one. It was nice to see him get rewarded and it was great to see him kind of uh get uh get his nose dirty around the net. And and we've kind of seen that throughout for, from Pooley RV all season long. And I think that was just a goal that and it, this and this type of goal that Pauly Harvey scored is something that the Oilers are going to look for a lot more for, I think, heading into games three and four, is kind of f- bearing down, focusing on their execution, especially when they're in and around the net. So in, in all honesty, I was really happy to see Jesse Pauly Harvey um, get on the board and get on the board first, especially uh, for Edmonton. It was nice kind of not to see Connor or Leon get on the board for once because, you know, I hear from all my friends who are fans of different teams, uh, from the Leafs fans, Avs fans, Canucks fans. Oh, you guys only have two two players that can score. Well, actually, I hate to break the news to you guys. We have a uh, we have a third. Uh, we have a third scorer that can actually uh, rip pucks home top shelf. <laughs> whatever when that, and he's always open in the slot, which is quite convenient for the two players that we have. So, yeah. Well, what about you, Eric? What What did you yeah. think about Pe- Pooley RV kind of bearing down there? For sure. And just to touch on your last point there, I think that it's one of those things where until the Oilers have other players who are are viewed around the rest of the league as not just complimentary pieces, but guys who you can count on to score on a regular basis. That whole one man, two man team mentality is going to stay um, for, you know, opposition fan bases. It, you look at a guy like Jesse Pugliarvi, if he can become a 50 to 60 point player, if Nugent Hopkins, you know, I mean, he was on pace for a, another 50 point season this year, and that's been sort of where he's been more often than not throughout his career. <clears throat> but like if, if they can be that consistently and, and you got a guy like Tyson Berry, who I think a lot of fans also forget about, but even Darnell Nurse, these are guys who they they haven't been looked at as star players around the league for very long. And, and you know, we in oil country get to watch them all the time. So we're seeing how good they actually are. But it will take the Oilers winning in the playoffs and these guys producing year after year for this team to be viewed as not just Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl's team. Um, but as for Pooley um, I, as I alluded to off the top of the show, you and I predicted back in January, I think you had 10 goals for Jesse and I had 12 goals for him. He ended up with 15 goals in 55 games, which would have put him on pace for 22 goals in a full 82 game season. And I expect that we'll see him in that 20 to 25 goal range next year, especially if he's playing uh, on Connor McDavid's wing for the full year, and and I don't see any reason to split those two up right now. Oh, you'd certainly um, you'd certainly hope to see that too, and you kind of certainly hope to see him on getting some more power player ups as well too, because we're starting to see how how gritty of a player he is, and he's not afraid to kind of get into those dirty areas as well too. So I could kind of see him maybe starting to starting to maybe usurp Alex Chason or James Neal. Oh, he, he should already be. I mean, the, the fact that he wasn't on the power play after how well he's been playing, and he also has such a long reach. He's got long arms, a long stick, six foot four. He's got a big body. He's only just turned 23, so he hasn't even fully grown into his body. But when, when this guy gets to be in his mid to late 20s, uh, he's just going to be a force out there. I mean, he can extend plays in the zone and keep pucks alive like this is the this is the kind of guy that you want on the power play plus it gives the oilers an extra right shot out there so um you know i i think that ken holland getting him for just over a million dollars a year was a steal this year and it's probably going to be one of the best bargain contracts on the team next year as well oh i certainly agree with that too and i can't wait to see him kind of um, retrieving more pucks and lower this power play too. I, I I am on the I'm of the belief that I think James Neal's his 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 wheels are kind of gone and are starting to wear down. Maybe I won't say gone. Mm-hmm. Um, are are wearing down and his puck retrieval when he's on the power play seems to be a little bit slower and I, and, and yes he just seems to have a lot more jump in his step especially when he's put put into into these positions when he's playing with Connor when he's playing with Leon. Um, he just right. seems to have a lot more jump in his step, and t- to see him kind of retrieve pucks and win board battles as well too on the power play would be so nice to see. And I feel like that would be really effective in these next couple games here. That's just maybe if Tippett's listened to our podcast, you know, <laughs> maybe take a take. I a- would. I would love if Dave listened, um, but I I think he's got more important things to do, and I'm completely fine with that. I, I'm happy with him prepping for uh, 
game three tomorrow night. All right, let's uh, really let's quick, really really quick, Eric. Though I want to get your thoughts on on Dave mm-hmm. Tippett's um, new playoff beard. What are your thoughts on it? Have you taken a look at it? <laughs> yeah, I have. I mean, it's kind of it, it kind of having the mask this season defeats the purpose of it because the only time we get to see it is in the post game press conference. But I know <laughs> that uh, there's been an online movement for. Um, the tip stash to come back for a while now. So uh, it was funny when he mentioned in his presser the other night that his wife had been reading stuff online about how fans wanted him to grow the mustache back. So, you know, if the Oilers were able to go on a deep run, we might be able to see it in uh, its full form. But um, if they, if they don't start uh, elevating their play pretty soon, that beard might not last much longer. Yeah, I know. I love it. I love the tip stash. I, I want it to return, but <laughs> I, it'd be so hard for me to watch a post game presser with, with, with Dave with a, a full on white, white sheet along yeah. his face. I, I don't know if I'd be able to take him seriously. I, I'm, I'd kind of be starting to think, hey, he's actually quite a he's, He seems to be a lot more of a nicer guy than he <laughs> seems to be in, in the press series. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? And I, I think sometimes he does get a bad rap for that. But when you when you catch Dave after like a big night, I mean, the night when Connor got 100 points or or games like that, he's smiling ear to ear and talking, oh. you know, so positively. So, you know, he does he does give a bit of that stern presence on the bench when you see him. But I'm fine with that, too, as long as uh, the team's playing well. And uh, under his watch the past two seasons, the Oilers have been a very good regular season team. It's just a matter of now transitioning that over to the playoffs. Um, So let's just talk about Edmonton's start to game one now. And the Oilers actually led the league in first period goals this season, but I thought they came out completely flat on Wednesday. They didn't even have a shot on goal in the first eight minutes of the game. Zane, do you chalk up their slow start to just playoff nerves or do you think, why do you think it took them that long to get a, a even a single shot on Connor Hellebuck? You know, I, I kind of thought it started in goal, to be honest. I, I thought um, the order is kind of jittery start. It, the, the jitters were certainly evident, but I think they were most certainly evident in Mike Smith. Now, I'm not going to say that Mike Smith has not did not play well that game. I think he played extraordinary in that game. I think he played has played extraordinary in both games. Um, however, I think that those first couple minutes into the game, there were a few little knuckleballers that were shot towards him, and he was bobbling, and he was bobbling them, kind of letting them run loose a little bit. And he was having a bit more of a harder time kind of trickle down, and I think it all starts from your goaltender when it comes to being ready, me- being mentally ready for big games like this. You want to see that your goalie's dialed in, uh, but when you see a go- your go- your own goalie kind of letting a few shots kind of you know make you kind of take a few drops, few breaths or make your heart bu- uh, jump a little bit um that could kind of throw your team off a little bit so i think it kind of started off in, in net um however they were able to kind of overcome those jitters in the first eight, after those first eight minutes we started to see a little bit more scoring opportunities um i was kind of frustrated that there were only there was only one power play for the Oilers that game uh, i mm-hmm. must say that the that the roughing was um not up to par it, 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 to my standards. Uh, maybe Eric, I'll let you kind of speak I, I, to that. You know, I'm, I'm, I actually have that question for you in a little bit, if you don't mind holding off for a minute. Uh, no but problem. yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, the, uh, the, the roughing <laughs> it's, it's not been great to say the least. And like I said, I do have a question for, for you about that, but yeah, I mean, you'd obviously like to see more power plays to this point. It's, it's just something that we're we're not probably going to see much of. The Oilers are going to have to win this series at five on five. And I think for, for me, despite their slow start, I just felt like the Oilers deserved a better fate in game one. I, I thought that they, they started to get their game on track later in the first period. There was some intensity, some pushing and shoving with McDavid and Neil Pionk in the corner. And then you kind of saw that full scrum at center ice and Mike Smith was right in the, the heart of it. But um they they outplayed the Jets for much of that game, and um, unfortunately for the Oilers, one lucky defe- uh, deflection that beat Mike Smith in the third period was ultimately the game winner. And then, of course, the Jets added a couple insurance markers when uh, when Mike Smith was pulled. But yeah, uh, and, and and no one knew that puck went in as well too. Even Logan yeah. Stanley himself, who had kind of fired the initial shot, um, was was kind of uh, dumbfounded when he when the play turned back up the ice and he was kind of carrying the puck up, <laughs> and the, the horn rang. <laughs> everyone, I think everyone was a little bit confused with what had happened there, and um, you know, little did we know that um, that Dominic Toninato had had, had deflected that home. Yeah. And then of course, you know, you get that horn, that unfamiliar sounding horn to stop play. Um, 
just about maybe less than 10 seconds later. But, you know, that game was much closer than the final score would indicate. It just came down to Hellebuck making one more save than Smith did. And realistically, if if Smith handles that bobbling puck that, uh, that, that led to the first goal, um, Pullman's goal in the second period, we're talking about a 1-1 game, or even if that deflection goes a quarter of an inch the other way and rings off the post, you know, it's a one nothing win for the Oilers. So I, I don't feel too bad about, about that one. It, it was, you know, it's a game of, of bounces, and, and the Jets got them and the Oilers didn't. I'd, I'd even kind of argue that this this could this game could have been tied up at 2-2 two, two, um, if there hadn't been a little bit of mis- miscommunication when Mike Smith was initially heading to the bench when they were initially pulling him. Yeah, um, I mean, we I don't know, know what would have happened, right? Yeah, we don't really know what kind of happened there. It seemed as though Mike Smith, um, after a kind of second or third, after a two or three looks, it, it seemed that like he was kind of already trying to get a head start to the bench, and he was a lot closer than I think that the bench had expected him to be. And it seemed as though... Um, he had gone a little bit too early. And although the Oilers had possession, it wasn't firm established possession. When I say that, I mean like, you know, you know, you know, taking the, you know, ripping the puck around, um, around the offensive zone. It was certainly not at that point yet. It was still kind of up for grabs. And I kind of thought it was on Smith for kind of already skating to the bench to get that sixth man out there, which I totally understand. However, I think it would have been nice to see a little bit of a pushback to tie that game at 2-2. Uh, to, at the, in, within the third period. Yeah, and in fairness, I don't want to hang you know much of anything on Smith so far because, it, in my opinion, like we just talked about how Jesse might have been the Oilers' best forward in Game One, but Smith is probably the Oilers' MVP through two games, wouldn't you say? Oh, I would wholeheartedly agree. Yes, especially um, especially in that second game. I think the reason that um, that Edmonton was able to hang around and and, and keep a scoreless t- uh, tie going into overtime was Mike Smith, especially in that first period when again <laughs> the Oilers needed to settle down a little bit. And you know, notwithstanding Connor McDavid and Leon Drysital, would you go as far to say that Mike Smith was the Oilers' third most valuable player all season? Oh yes, I would one hundred percent agree with that too. I, I think that when he came back from injury, he he Mike Smith obviously brings a lot to this dressing room, and I think he means a lot to the team. And I, I believe that he is a, a a core part to this leadership team. You see throughout practices, you see Connor, you see Leon kind of skate over to Smith to to hear him out. Um, you see him, it, you see them in games, kind of the, the core kind of circling around Mike Smith to listen to what he's got to say. I don't know if you caught yesterday during the game where Mike Smith was speaking to the ref and Connor went in to listen to see what that, what that conversation was about. So they obviously, they, they, they hold what he has to say to a really, really high level of importance. And I think that that goes beyond his impact with just on the ice in Edmonton. I think he's got a huge off ice uh, impact within this dressing room. And yeah. I think he has a, a really special ability to bring that team together and bring the leadership core together, especially. And, and I think that's also rare for a goaltender. I, I, I don't, think many goaltenders are sort of locker room leaders where they stand up and get the team fired up I, I, for the most part. And I've never been in an NHL dressing room, uh, but you know, just from hearing analysts talk about it and just from former players, it sounds like the goaltenders mostly keep to themselves. And I mean, even just from playing hockey in, in, in my, my own experience at, a, you know, a much lower level, but you know, there's, I've had goaltenders who I played with who were more, uh, charismatic guys and other ones who are more quiet. I think it it depends on the person, but in general, I would say goaltenders, you know, want to be focused on their own game and, and doing their own thing. So uh, for Mike Smith to be that fiery personality who can sort of get the boys, you know, energized before they get out on the ice, that's that's sort of a unique role for a goaltender to play, I would say. Yeah, no, I would 100% agree with that as well, too. And it's, uh, I'm not saying he, he should be, you know he deserve he deserves that C more than Connor or anything. Mm-hmm. But you know, you kind of you kind of think back about you, know, you think back to previous goaltenders in, in the in the NHL who have had some sort of influence on that team like in, in a strong way. And I think back uh, to when Roberto Luongo was named the captain of the Vancouver right. Canucks. And I think to myself, oh my goodness, that's you, you. You're not only putting on a franchise kind of tag on this guy, but you're also asking him to to wear that C technically and and be that guy to speak to the media after every game and, and asking a goaltender to do that. You know, when they're already being asked to be mentally strong, prepare for every game, and and be your kind of your your last line of defense. 
Mm -hmm. I think it's a lot to be naming yeah. a goaltender you, officially with the C, right? Yeah, but, you can be a leader without actually wearing the C. And if you remember, the league wouldn't allow uh, Luongo to actually wear the C on his jersey. So they, they had the guy who painted his helmet paint a C <laughs> over the chin. So yeah. that, was, that was the only way that he could actually have the C on. And then, of, of course, it uh, obviously went to Henrik Sedin, who it should have went to anyway. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So we were just talking about um, power plays a, a minute ago. And, I, and now I want to get into it with you because I, the main reason I wanted to wait is because I think that this is something that's relevant in both games. So it kind of gives us a natural place to transition from game one to game two. And that is the horrible officiating that we've watched so far. <laughs> and and look, the Oilers inexplicably don't draw a ton of penalties, even during the regular season, despite having the best player in the game. So I wasn't expecting any of the small stuff to get called. But the number of blatant infractions that the Jets have been allowed to get away with in this series is ridiculous. Even if you're not an Oilers fan, I don't believe there's any way you can watch what we've seen and say that, the, the Jets have played clean hockey all the way through. Now, now I'm not saying the Oilers ha haven't gotten away with a few calls too, because they have. But that number is far in favor of the Jets, to the point where McDavid almost has no room to skate because he's being hooked, held, slashed, or interfered with every time he steps on the ice. So I have a two-part question for you, Zane. The first is simply, how frustrating is it for you as an Oilers fan to watch the team's best player and Art Ross Trophy winner have to put up with this garbage night after night? And secondly, does it hurt the growth of the game for superstars like McDavid or Dreisaitl to not be able to showcase their elite skills in the playoffs? Um, well, I'm going to answer that second part first, mainly okay. because I think, I think that... Um, yeah, it's it, it definitely hurts the game, hurts the hurts the brand of the game if the best players in the league are not able to kind of show what they, what they can do. Um, but I think that's gonna I'm gonna kind of tie that to the first part of your question, which is you know how frustrated I am with it and and you know what I think should be done. And I have a bit of an unpopular opinion in, in Edmonton. And, and yes, I understand how much abuse that that Connor McDavid and Leon Draisaitl take on a nightly basis. Um, however, I do see them throw it back. Which you don't have, which you haven't really seen um, much from many other superstars in the this past. This year, they have especially. I've noticed McDavid and Drysaitel giving giving back, you know, physically more, and I think that's just a result of them saying we're not taking this anymore. If you're going to do this to us night after night, we're, we're you know we're going to start throwing some hits. Yeah, no, one hundred percent, and I think it's a matter of self defense, obviously, because yeah. they there's there's a lot of times in which the refs aren't calling anything, and 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 I don't blame Connor or Leon or Nuge for kind of reacting in the ways that they do, because you know obviously if if you were kind of being obstructed with any in any single way and not getting any kind of calls, you would obviously kind of react and lash out, especially in the moment with hockey being just a, a reactionary, a, a reactive kind of sport. It is, right. Um, so my opinion is that, like, yes, I am frustrated that the that, that Connor and Leon were not able to kind of um, put on the show that they usually would because of how how tight checking this this series has been and how kind of they've been constantly been been targeted by the Winnipeg D. However, I I I I am kind of oh I'm not okay I I I see where the league and I see where the refs are coming from because they have started to see Connor and Leon. Um, fire some stuff back i think there has been some conversations around the league especially after when after mcdavid kind of had that high hit on uh yesterday called can earlier on in the season when when he kind of went for his head with a bit with his elbow earlier on there has been some kind of discussions with between i think um organizations about you know connor and leon kind of giving it back so um i am frustrated that the Oilers are not getting power play opportunities to kind of show their offense and set up their offense but at the same time mm -hmm. I, I want people to kind of remember that I think it, it's got to go both ways, right? You can't just you, you can't just call everything on McDavid and, and, and Drysdale that, that that they're receiving, but you also kind of have to call them for what they're giving back as well, too. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you, you're going to have to even it out, and and that's called managing a game, right? And yeah, this kind of all they, they and this, talk about yeah. that game management too, right? Exactly, right? And we saw this, we saw that firsthand this season with Tim Peel, and and, and this whole instance of you know, you know, when when he was caught on mic saying that he should have, he wanted to even it out between the between the um, between the teams. Um, but yeah, that's my opinion and that's my take. I think Connor and Leon take a lot of abuse. I also think they give it back as well too. I'm not saying that they they 
They deserve less. More power. recently than not, they have. But in past seasons, I think that it's been, you know, they've skated away from it. And maybe they've yes. this is this has come to the point where they just said, well, you know, if no one's going to defend us, we're going to have to go out there and defend ourselves. And um, Co- Connor throwing that elbow back in Mont- in Montreal, um, like I think it was almost two months ago now, that yeah. was the result of someone taking a high hit on him as well. So, you know, it's just come to the point where it's like you said, it, it gets to the point of self-defense. But it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, it's very frustrating for me anyway. And I, I know a lot of Oilers fans feel that way as well to see that these two elite players who have, and, and they are, you know, the, the two top scorers in the league right now and have the best power play in the league. And they don't get the chance to go on the power play ever because teams know that, you know, the only way you can really slow them down is to, take fouls on them and and we see it like mcdavid realistically could draw a penalty every shift he's not going to get a power play every shift and and he's not the only superstar in the league who has to deal with this it just for me this balancing out of the the power plays <clears throat> all it does is reward less lesser skilled players and ryan rashad from tsn tweeted out a screenshot of mcdavid being pinned to the boards by two I jets know. players last night and <clears throat> And he wasn't even the guy who chipped the puck into the zone. And, and of course, no penalty. And then Jeff Viette from McKean's Hockey, he had an interesting tweet that I wanted to pull up here as well, if you give me one second. So mm-hmm. he put up he, he put up a graphic of the top 20 scorers in the league and where they rank in terms of penalties drawn. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Connor McDavid ranks 26th in the league in penalties drawn. Leon Dreisaitl ranks 313th. Oh my goodness. And it's just like, how can you have... Uh, there, there is no way that there are 25 players in the NHL who deserve to be drawing more penalties than Connor McDavid. No, 100%. And, and, I, and I think what we need to clarify here is that we're not saying that, that Connor and Leon deserve special treatment. I think it's just... it's it's There needs to be some parity across the league, yes. for sure. I think there needs to be some sort of... Um, there needs to be some equal eyes looking at all these instances for sure. And, and so I, I wanted think... to, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no. I, yes. And I know the league doesn't even like to say parody. They, I think they, the term <laughs> they try to use is competitive balance, but uh, anyway, I wanted to read the tweet that uh, Jeff had following up on the, the graph that he posted. He said, here are the NHL's top 20 scores this season and where they rank in penalties drawn per hour. This doesn't look like a team that gives their stars preferential treatment. It looks like a league that punishes their stars and lets their lesser opponents drag them down. What do you think about that? Well, I would 100% agree with that. 100%, 110% agree with that, I yeah. believe. I, I, I don't think the NHL does enough to protect its, its, its top players. Uh, you look at other leagues like the NBA. Uh, they they go above and beyond to protect guys like LeBron, um, like like Anthony Davis, absolutely, like Kevin Durant. There is so much in place to ensure that they their talent is displayed you, on the highest level possible. Like even in the NFL, right? Tom Brady and any sort of kind of sack or any sort of kind of malicious intent on Tom Brady um, is is highly regarded as a as something detrimental to the game, right? Right. And, and I know you're a basketball guy, too. And I think we even talked on uh, the podcast back in January. You told me that I think you had two basketball playoff pools you did this year. Yeah, or, you're right. Or you, yeah. Had a, or you had a hockey one and a basketball one. And uh, I was yeah. asking, how did you end up doing in those, by the way? Oh, uh, they were they were they were close. They were close affairs. Um, OK, I finished second in one basket or in one hockey pool and, and third in one basketball pool. And the other two were kind of. Uh, tough first round exits in the playoffs. <laughs> oh. well, yeah. good, good for you and the ones that you did well in. But um, and, and, you know, just to finish up on this, I think the most telling thing of all was during the first intermission on Sportsnet when the entire panel was talking about how the Jets are getting away with countless penalties in this game. And that include that included Cassie Campbell and Kevin Bieksa. And I don't think anyone would describe either of them as Oilers supporters on most occasions. Oh, well, yeah, not at all. <laughs> I think, I think, in my personal opinion, I think Cassie Campbell Pascal is one of the biggest flames pushers or, or biggest flames homers, and, and it's 
in, in all honesty, it was kind of nice to see Kevin Bieksa defend how bad the refing was that past yeah. that, that game as well too. I know we we in Edmonton we we kind of have Bieksa in a bit of a negative light, but I, I must say, you know, um, re- disregard his playing days and disregard you know the amount of abuse he kind of and liberties he took on some Oilers players. He's a right. great analyst. I think he's the best guy on sports at the moment. I think they did they were amazing for they, they did an amazing job kind of grooming him for this and and he's got he's a great personality to have on tv to be honest yeah I, and like i said I, I mean i'm i still hold some grudges against him from when he played against the oilers but as as a broadcaster i think he is doing a pretty good job even if i don't agree with everything that he says uh, he, he's definitely added some a different element to the broadcast anyway. And I think as ESPN takes over the American broadcast rights next season, he might be the type of guy that they're looking for. So I, I'm not saying he's going to leave Sportsnet, but that's the type of uh, panelist I expect to see when ESPN and TNT take over the hockey rights in 2021-22. Yeah, I think that's going to change the, the entire landscape of the NHL broadcasting um, community. I, I think you know we we've seen Ray Ferraro, we've seen Brian Boucher that they've already kind of been been tied to ESPN, and we could potentially be seeing Frank Saravalli being kind of. Um, I think he's going there for sure. He, I mean, he didn't he didn't come out right and say it, but when he said he was leaving TSN, if you w- go and look at the mentions uh, in that tweet. <laughs> Everyone's basically saying like, oh, I know you're going to show up on on ESPN and he deserves it, too. He's done such a great job the last six years on TSN. And of course, it would allow him to work in the States. He is American. So I would say that 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 probably is the landing spot for Frank. Yeah, he's also kind of been acting as the well. He's been the president of the Professional Hockey Writers Association as well, too, which mm-hmm. is uh, not so not an easy job <laughs> at, all, at all as well, too. But it's been interesting to kind of hear these rumors, um, you know, in the in the in the recap of, of these of these negotiations between the NHL and the TV networks. They're they're kind of looking for their own uh, uh, Adrian Wojnarowski. Yeah. Uh, that the NBA has, so I think we're going to be seeing some some similar Woj bombs out of Frank Saravalli. I don't know what they're <laughs> going to call them. <laughs> They'll think of something, but uh, yeah. no, I I think that Frank, you know, he deserves that job. He he lives in Philadelphia, which is on the East Coast where ESPN is located. So I think it's just it, it makes sense for him to go there. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think that would be the right move for ESPN. I think that would be the right move for the league as well, too. They want to they want to sell the game a lot more in the United States uh, every year. And I think Frank's the guy to kind of uh, draw people in as well, too, and, and create and generate exciting content as well, too. For sure. And just sticking with McDavid and Dreisaitl, we were you know talking about how they don't get calls a moment ago. Um, head coach Dave Tippett made the decision to reunite them after the team only scored one goal in game one. And I said on my playoff preview podcast earlier this week that the Oilers are a much tougher team to play against when McDavid and Dreisaitl are centering their own lines. And even though it's so much fun to watch these two dynamic offensive players play together, it just reduces the skill and the effectiveness of your other lines, specifically your second line. So were you for or against them being put back together for game two? And do you think Tippett will stick with these lines for game three? I I was not really surprised seeing Connor and Leon playing together um, for, sec- for for game two. I, I think he wanted to provide a different look um, with Ehlers out of the lineup. Um, I think the Jets were kind of missing that secondary scoring. And I think that he was just looking to totally out, out, out score and kind of dominate and overpower the first the first line of the Winnipeg Jets because that's that was the ideal matchup that he was kind of looking for all, all game long all, and he is looking for all series long against Shifley, uh, Wheeler, and Connor. Um, uh, going forward here, I do kind of see see them being separated in in game three to kind of balance out the the offensive opportunities and the the prowess that is within the top nine. But that's not. I I don't mean to take away from the the game that Nugent Hopkins played yesterday with with Yamamoto and Kahu, and we eventually saw James Neal get a chance up there as well too towards the end of the game. I think that line actually did a great job of kind of um, holding on its own and kind of maintaining it and, and establishing some cycle time as well too. Um, but at the end of the day, you, you, you results kind of speak for themselves uh, and results speak for performance as well too. So I think going forward for Game Three, we're going to see them split up just to kind of. Uh, balance the attack out, but also with the potential of Nikolai Ehlers coming uh, coming back into the lineup, I think they're going to just try to try to neutralize these two these two top lines as well too, or provide the Ehlers line with a bit more of a of a um, 
uh, of of a challenge, I would say. What about you? Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, I have to give Hellebuck credit. I mean, yeah. he's allowed just one goal through two games in this series against a team with the top two scores in the NHL. And while I'm sure there are some people blaming McDavid and Dreisaitl for their lack of production, in a tight series like this one, you need your bottom six forwards to step up and get a goal. It can't just be on McDavid and Dreisaitl every night. Unfortunately for the Oilers, they don't win very often when the dynamic duo don't factor in on the score sheet. And, you know, they are the highest paid players on the team. They are the biggest stars. Everyone counts on them to provide a certain amount of offense. So they do need to get going. If McDavid and Dreisaitl are shut down, the Oilers aren't going to win this series. But that being said, if if we're also relying on them to be the only two players who are going to score for the Oilers, they're not going to win this series either. Like you, you look at a couple guys like Josh Archibald and Jujar Kara, they had a couple decent chances on Friday, but you know they still have nothing to show for it. So one of these guys has to eventually put the puck in the back of the net, and maybe if one goes in, that'll open the floodgates, and it'll, you know, the the Oilers will be able to turn the tide from there and start to be putting to putting together games where they're scoring two three goals more consistently because even if even if it is going to be a low scoring series you're you know you're going to need to at least score two two or three goals to win a 2-1 game a 3-2 game it's it's not going to be like last night every night where it's you know a one nothing overtime game um so i'll just ask you uh, i i don't want to pin either of these losses on any one player i don't think you can in a team sport but that being said, who needs to raise their level of play in Game 3 for the Oilers to have a better chance to get back in this series? Well, to all of those people, firstly, actually, who think the Oilers have not played well these first two games, I think you're completely wrong because the advanced analytics they have. themselves. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at, I'm looking at natural statric right now. Uh, Edmonton's Corsi, uh, Corsi 4 percentage, 58.02%, uh, which is second in the league for amongst teams in the in the playoffs at the moment, right? Having only played two games. Uh, if you look at their kind of their expected goals for percentage, uh, it is second in the league, only behind the Boston Bruins at 58.47%. If you look at the Winnipeg Jets, um, expected goals for percentage, they're all the way down at 15th out of 16th teams at 41.53%. So that means Edmonton is out chancing and, and is getting a lot more scoring opportunities than the Winnipeg Jets. However, we are kind of seeing some shades of last year's bl- playoff, uh, unfortunately, where we've kind of, the Edmonton Oilers have kind of run into a bit of a hot goalie here. Now, um, in terms of going forward here, who needs to really raise their level? I think the Oilers have kind of played really well. I think all four lines have done a really good job of kind of generating opportunities, being responsible in their own line or in their own end as, as well. I would also say that the that the, the top six D men have also done their great have have done a, a, a more than um, more than admirable job of kind of keeping the puck out of their own net, but also kind of transporting the puck to the forwards as well too. Um, I would you would obviously love to see a guy like Zach Cassian get a goal or a guy like yeah. uh, Josh Archibald to get to get the, the and these are the energy guys of the Oilers, right? Or to, even a big hit like like yeah, Josh yeah. Archibald had a huge hit on Demello in Game oh, One. That's that what we need for Cassian. Like, we need to see 2017 Cassian step up and play like that. And also, uh, I mean, just to touch on your your point earlier, like you you said the advanced analytics, you know, favor the Oilers. Edmonton has also outshot Winnipeg 71 to 58 in this series. Like, Connor Hellebuck is, has been the MVP of this series so far. He's the reason why the Jets have a 2-0 lead. Oh, certainly, for sure. And, you know... It would be awesome to see a guy like Zach Cassian or Josh Archibald have a bit more of an influence on this series, but it's been such a tight checking affair. And we kind of saw Zach Cassian trying, or it's, we saw Coach Tippett kind of try and get and elevate uh, Cassian's intensity by putting him on a, on a line with McDavid and Dry Settles like, for a little bit in the second period yesterday on Friday during game two. Um, didn't really see much out of that, unfortunately. But, you know, if I were Dave Tippett and I, if I kind of had the opportunity to to put someone or inject somebody into this lineup, um, and I think a lot of people in Edmonton would agree with me on this, is is, is Tyler Ennis. I it's 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 been a long time since the Edmonton Oilers fan base has seen Tyler Ennis in a game, and Tyler Ennis has played fairly well all season long. He's been able to inject speed into the lineup when needed. He's been called and he's been he's been asked to perform some different roles. He's been on the taxi squad, pa- practicing really hard every day. Um, it'd be nice to kind of see him 
be injected into the lineup for a guy like James Neal, who's kind of, uh, whose whose legs have kind of been, um, you know, kind of slowed down by a little bit of cement, or maybe well, he's never been the fastest skater anyway. But you know, I think he had that foot issue last year as well, right? And yeah. he actually looked better in the bubble after he had those four months off to to heal up. But yeah. just this season, I think we've started to see his play tail off a little bit, and he was sick early in the year, yeah. um, so it's just. It's it's a tough contract for the Oilers, but I mean we have to put contracts out the window in the playoffs. It doesn't matter what someone's making. We're just worrying about what they're doing right now. Exactly. There's no cap in the playoffs, so it doesn't no. matter how much people are getting paid. But- Ask Tampa about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's an entirely new kind of kind of I can of worms to open up there too for sure. Yeah. Um, but yet, in my opinion, I think Tyler Ennis needs to be in the lineup. He's had a great season so far. When he is in the lineup, uh, it'd be nice to kind of see him swap in for for another forward. Or... I would like to see him in the lineup too. I think the issue is is that Dave Tippett wants anyone who he puts in his bottom six to be able to kill penalties. And Tyler Ennis is a smaller, skilled player who has really nifty hands and he doesn't kill penalties. So because he's not like a defensive stalwart, Tippett doesn't trust having him in that in that spot. I think one thing we've seen this year is when Ennis gets into the lineup, he's usually playing on one of the top two lines. And even when he does get dropped to the bottom two lines, he's not there very long before he's pulled out and put back on the taxi squad. No, 100%. But I I kind of disagree with, with Dave Tippett's notion of always injecting and always having a, a grizzled veteran in the lineup like James yeah. Neal. Uh, you know, I don't mean to rag, to rag on you, real deal, but at the same time, <laughs> I, I think you need to have a you, you need a bit of a change up. I, you know, James just is not being that he's not being able to provide that intensity that I think Tyler Ennis really brings. Bring in another veteran. Tyler Ennis has played playoff games before. He has some experience playing uh, under the limelight. He's played for Team Canada at the World Championships. He's played at the World Juniors as well too. Tyler Ennis is an energy player who's fast. He can actually he, skate with Ryan McLeod as well too on that fourth line potentially with Zach Cassian. Right, he's an Edmonton kid too. That's one of the things I wish that the Oilers had fans for the playoff run because I feel like someone like him who grew up cheering for the Oilers and ever since he's been an Oiler, he really hasn't had many chances to play in front of his home fans. Like as soon as the trade happened, basically a couple weeks later, the pandemic hit and then he played the bubble in front of no fans. He played all this season in front of no fans. I almost feel like he's getting robbed of his chance to be an oiler a little bit because he's not getting the full experience of playing in front of the people of Edmonton. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I, I kind of feel bad for him too. He, he he could have had a bit more of a better impact, I think, in the bubble last year, but he went down with that uh, with that really gruesome ankle injury mm-hmm. um, after he kind of took that awkward fall. But it was nice to see him kind of get ready and, and come back to camp really reju- rejuvenated this season. It's just it's just kind of hasn't worked out in his favor in terms of cracking opportunities to get into the lineup. Um, you know, you know, if I were to kind of make a prediction as to what's what the lineup could look like next 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 game, mm-hmm. knowing Dave Tippett, I don't think he's going to actually put Tyler Anderson. I think he could potentially be putting Gaetan Haas in because I think um, he would like an, another center in the lineup just to provide McLeod with a little bit of more stability. But but any anybody else to kind of also try and win faceoffs, which is an area of which the Oilers have struggled throughout these first few games as well. Too, possession has been a has been tough to come by when the Oilers are losing draws. And you know, I think Bob Stoffer is a huge homer for and the Oilers going out uh, or going out at the trade deadline or going out this future offseason to get a third line sediment who can win draws. A guy like Luke Glendening, right? Um, but. I personally think that the, that in, in the way that I think Dave Tippett has has kind of acted this year, he might be looking to add Gaetan Haas into the lineup instead of Tyler Ennis. And that, that, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing Haas in the lineup as well too. But you think, you know, who do you take out for Haas? Yeah, I mean, I think McLeod might come out, and you do lose a little bit of speed. Um, the thing with Ryan McLeod is though he had played ten NHL games before he made his playoff debut. Like you're taking a guy who spent most of the year in the AHL, most of the last two years really. And now here he is at 21 years old being thrust into this very important time of year, the most important time of year playing as the third line or fourth line center. And it's just, you know, it's a lot to ask of a kid uh, who's just trying to cut his teeth in the league. Yeah, certainly. And that's, and and I don't think that we're kind of, kind of coming down hard on how he's performing. Not at all. all. No, no, he's minutes. You saw his minutes drop the last game because, you know, Dave was cutting down his lineup and it just, 
you know, it, it's it's a tough situation for him. Like he and he had a really good chance to score in game one as well. It, it, it's just one of those things. You know, he's a, he's a young player in a in a tough situation trying to make the best of it. And I think he is going to be the Oilers future third line center and he's going to be a good one for years to come. He just needs a lot more experience before he he's ready for these moments. Yeah, I certainly agree. And I think he has a bright future as well, too. But, um, you know, just kind of looking ahead to tomorrow and 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 and, and Monday night, I, I, I kind of foresee Dave Tippett maybe injecting Gaetan Haas into the lineup. Yeah. If, he, if he is healthy, though, um, you know, we've kind of seen over the past couple of weeks that Gaetan Haas was held out of the lineup a little bit just in favor of Ryan McLeod, but also to kind of with injury prevention. So I'm, I'm wondering how, how healthy Gaetan Haas is and how ready to go he is as well, too. No, for sure. And, you know, Zane, uh, just to wrap up the show tonight, first of all, I want to thank you again for coming on and um, and breaking down these two games with me. Uh, I just want to get your score prediction for Game 3 in Winnipeg tomorrow night. Oh, my score prediction. I think I'm kind of hoping this this series will kind of open up a little bit next uh, these next couple games. So with a little bit more intensity on both sides, hopefully some defense will kind of maybe suffer at the expense of some offense, which would be nice to see in this in this series. <laughs> um, um, I'm kind of predicting a four three game in favor of the Oilers. I think um, I, I can't I can't go against the, I can't go against, I can't go against them right now. I don't see them going down three nothing at this point. Um, but what about you, Eric? What do you what do you, what's your, what's your prediction? Yeah, I mean, well. Tomorrow night isn't just the biggest game of the season. It's the biggest game the Oilers have played since Game 7 against the Anaheim Ducks four years ago. So uh, it's it's going to be one where they really have to give it everything they have, not to use a cliche there. And, you know, being two, down two games to none in this series, I, I don't feel too bad about the place that the Oilers are in. I think that they still have the confidence to beat the Jets. I mean, they went four and four one and oh in five games at Bell MTS place during the regular season. And McDavid had 14 points in those five games. So if there was ever a night for him to break out offensively, it would be tomorrow night. Yeah, I would, I expect that. I, and you certainly do expect the rest of the orders kind of team to, to, to perform. Yeah. And, and you certainly expect the, at the bottom six guys to also show up to, to play as many of them could be playing for contracts next year as well too. For sure. And just to answer your question, sorry, I forgot there. Uh, I'll, I'll say a three, one uh, road win. I think Mike Smith is going to stay strong and that he'll let one get past him, but the Oilers won't lose three straight. They'll, they'll find a way to solve Connor Hellebuck and remember that they were able to do it all season long and uh, they'll, they'll get the victory in Winnipeg. Certainly do hope so, Eric. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Zane, before we uh, call it a night, where can people follow you? Yeah, people can follow me on Twitter at, at Zane Banji, Z-A-I-N-B-H-A-N-J-I. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. Anywhere. <laughs> okay. Everyone, please go follow Zane. He's one of my favorite people to communicate with on Twitter. And, Zane, I hope to have you back either in the off season or next season sometime. And like I said, we're going to have some wins to talk about the next time you're on. Yes, that'd be great. Thank you again so much, <laughs> Eric, for, for having me on. I look forward to hopefully breaking down if you know, another game, playoff game with you here. Yeah, for sure. All right. So for Zane Banji, I'm Eric Friesen. This has been the 99 Forever Podcast. We're out. <laughs>